15 rounds, I think, for McCarthy. But the thing is, when he went on, he picked up more and more votes as time went on. He didn't lose votes as time was on, went on, like Jim Jordan is. That's the key difference between Kevin McCarthy's and his, all of his lost votes and Jim Jordan's lost votes. Jim Jordan, between the first lost vote and the second, just lost two more Republicans. Is that a good thing? No, that's a bad thing. He's not making progress. He's actively regressing further away from the speakership. Hakeem Jeffries still has more votes than Jim Jordan. Okay, let's talk about this. So for what, like the seventh or eighth time, the Republicans and the Democrats shuffled into Congress and tried to elect the speaker. The Republicans tried to, as they have the majority, elect the speaker. And once again, they have failed. Ever since Kevin McCarthy had the recall vote that ousted him, that was launched by Matt Gates, they have tried again and again and again and have failed. They tried it with Steve Scalise and they failed. Kevin McCarthy, of course, originally tried to hold off this speaker vote and he failed. And now we have Jim Jordan and he has failed. Not once, but now twice. The first time he had 201 votes, this time he has 199 votes. He's actively losing more votes as the elections and as the speakership votes go on. And so this isn't like when Kevin McCarthy first became speaker and he had like all these different votes again and again and again and again. He was picking up votes as time went on. So far, Jim Jordan has done nothing but lose votes as time goes on. I mean, Steve Scalise had a better chance of getting the speakership and got closer to the speakership than Jim Jordan did. And Jim Jordan still, even though now he's lost his second attempt of trying to become speaker, he apparently is not dropping out of the race. They're going to have another vote tomorrow, and it's probably going to end again with him failing, him losing, by possibly an even wider margin. How wide does the margin have to be before Jim Jordan gets the message that as this trailblazing, firebrand Republican, which has gotten very little legislation passed, but has fulfilled any number of speech requirements and the amount of ranting and raving that he has done within the office. It's just not a, it's just not a good look for the speakership. It's not what the Republicans want. It's not what the majority of the American people want. It's not what the Democrats want. And he can't get the votes. <sighs> but they're going to hold another vote at noon. Jordan's going to lose that other vote tomorrow at noon. And then we're going to be right back where we are now. Uh, I wanted to show you some reactions to this before I give you my take. Um, here is Nancy Pelosi talking about Jim Jordan losing the speakership vote. I'm just curious, what is your reaction to another failed speaker vote with Republicans? Well, I, I think uh, it was a triumph for democracy in our country that an insurrection was, was rejected uh, by the Republicans again as their candidate for speaker. Uh, we've always wished the winning party well as they choose their leader. I've never in the decades that I've been here, uh, when we've had a, a, a a uh, speaker's race on our side or their side, we've always respected each other's judgment. But today and yesterday, th that was an assault on our democracy as Jim Jordan assaulted our democracy on January 6th. I wish Jim Jordan would participate in our democracy more and pass the bill in his 16 years in Congress. But the thing that Nancy Pelosi is referring to is the fact that Jim Jordan was one of the House members who were actively pursuing an overturning of the presidential results in 2020 and was advocating for Mike Pence to overturn the election results, which is something that has who has ruffled a few feathers within the Democratic House, ruffled a few feathers with the majority of Americans, and has even led a few Republicans to feel maybe a little hesitant before supporting the man. Let me show you two examples of this. Uh, we've got one here with Dan Crenshaw, with this fact being brought to him as he is supporting Jim Jordan for the House, as he is trying to say that he's part of the solution, he's not part of the problem, you know, he's different, you don't understand. And then Tapper brings up the fact that Jim Jordan tried to defy a congressional subpoena and also tried to have Mike Pence overturn the election results undemocratically to have him anointed president. And this is what Crenshaw had to say. And what he said, I, thought, I think, is a little revealing. 
and it shows how he got so far in the speakership race in the first place to the point where he's even a viable nominee. People say, well, what, let's just bring McCarthy back and either that happens or McHenry gets it by default. Is that possible, you think? Anything's possible. These are very unlikely. Uh, McCarthy has to actually want to run. Um, there's out of protest, some some members will vote for McCarthy. He, he has no intention of running. Uh, Jordan has has been a true ally to McCarthy, uh, at, at least from everything I've seen uh, and and what McCarthy is saying now. And what what I would remind a lot of, uh, of the members who are against Jordan, um, you know, because because his his reputation precedes him, but his reputation has changed over time. He has become part of the solution, not part of the problem. He has long since been part of the solution. I've a lot of, a lot of good conversations with him. I've gotten to know him. Uh, there, there, there's a reason I support him. Um, he was trying giving to McHenry additional powers. Well, that still requires that still requires a, a, a vote, you know. And what kind of power? By the way, know? I like I love this smile. I love this smile from Jake Tapper. Look at that. Oh my God! Look at that smile. Look at that smile. He was going to say something. He held it off and he just put the card up his sleeve and now he's waiting. He's waiting, man. You want to know how I got these scars? Well, that still requires that still requires a, a, a vote, you know, and what kind of powers? I mean, at a certain point, you're just electing a speaker. Yeah. And so it, and he doesn't want that. He's asking yeah. us not to do that. I mean, he defied the congressional subpoena and he was trying to get Pence to overturn the electoral votes. But. Anyway, you're you're in the you're in the Jordan camp, uh, well, but a lot of them did that. If I if I held that grudge, I'd, I wouldn't have friends in right, the Republican two, conference. That's two thirds of the, a lot of them that's two thirds of the conference. So. That's a, that's a, that's an excellent point. Uh, <laughs> I was I was on an island there. Yeah, I hear you. I was on an island there. See, Dan Crenshaw was not one of the Republicans who called for democracy to be scalped while in the House. He didn't call for that. He wasn't one of the few people. Uh, he, he was not one of the ones who called for the election results to be overturned like Jim Jordan did. And even him, as somebody who's unsympathetic to that position, because he might have some basic adherence to a principle of democratic congressional, I mean, democratic constitutional republic rule, as in you elect somebody and they get to hold the office after you elect them. Um, even he has to admit that, look, this is the party. You've got to work with people who are willing to ignore the results of the election. You, you, you have to because that's just the Republican Party today. And that is how Jim Jordan, somebody who hasn't passed a bill in 16 years in Congress, but because of the of the far fringe of his party, like Matt Gates, Marjorie Taylor Greene and Lauren Bulbert holding the party hostage, he has become a nominee. He has been pushed up to the front of the line in the speakership process because they know he's crazy enough for them and so he's one of the candidates that they will sign on to vote for and probably won't veto. There's also a good chance if he becomes speaker, that just means that the Democrats will pick up 30 to 40 votes next election because he'll engage in some absolute nonsense. He'll make a fool of the Republican Party and we'll just be able to play Jim Jordan quotes at every election that we go into. But whether or not that would be good for the Democrats long-term electorally, for the country, it'd be terrible for the short term. For aid to Ukraine, obviously, it would be terrible for the short term. And so we should pursue his failure. But thankfully, it doesn't look like we're going to need to give a lot of effort to pursue his failure as each speakership vote gets worse and worse. But the question of Jim Jordan being House Speaker was brought up to the person that Jim Jordan said should have overturned the Democratic results of the election. It was brought up to Mike Pence. And Mike Pence was equally as spineless as you would expect from him from his previous statements about this. Vote to elect a Speaker of the House. Jim Jordan would be an outstanding Speaker of the House. He is a principled conservative, uh, just as Steve Scalise is. Uh, and uh, at, at a time when we see war raging uh, in Eastern Europe, uh, uh, the worst attack on the Jewish state uh, of Israel since its refounding in 1948. Yeah. Challenges here at home in our economy, a crisis at our border. Uh, the American people want to see the Republican conference come together, elect a speaker, and get back to work. Well, it's interesting to me to hear you say that, that, that Jim Jordan would be a great speaker, given he was someone who sent a text to the chief of staff on January 5th that outlined for you to violate the Constitution and block the certification of the election. I mean, do you really believe that's someone who should be third in line to the presidency? 
I have immense respect for Jim Jordan. He's a man of integrity, and uh, I've known him for many years. I, I, I was not aware of, uh, of his opinion going into January 6th. So my, that doesn't bother My you. interaction with Congressman Jordan in December was uh, simply over the legitimate objections that members of Congress were permitted to file uh, under the law. But look, we, we... The one thing Mike Pence ever did that was good, right? I, his statements on conversion therapy were gross. Just uh, his his uh, approach to needle exchange programs and 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 his home state were, were terrible, and it led to a spike in HIV. Um, there is a, a bunch of things that he has done that is very bad. The one thing he did that was good in his career was simply fulfill the basic duties of his office as vice president and transitioning one administration to the next administration. The peaceful transferal of power that our democracy is built upon and the Republican base and the Republican Party will never let him forget that he did that one good thing. They will never, ever let him forget it, not for good reasons, but because they think it was bad. It was bad that he allowed democracy to take place. It was bad that he didn't interfere with the peaceful of transition of power. And it was bad that he did not show sufficient loyalty to Big Daddy Trump. Look, I don't know who's gonna end up being House Speaker. If I had to put my money on someone, I'd probably put it on uh, uh, McHenry, who is the speaker, the temporary speaker. They might end up just making him speaker because they can't get anybody else to do the job. They can't elect anyone else. That might end up being the conclusion. But there is one other path, and I do advise Democrats at least think of this path. Right, Representative, Republican Representative Mike Rogers, who chairs the Armed Services Committee, told reporters Thursday after a closed-door House GOP meeting that he wants Minority Leader Hakeem Jeffries who has gotten every single Democrat to vote for him. He's at 212. He needs 217, so he just needs five flips to become House Speaker, to tell Republicans what concessions they'll have to make for Democrats to help them elect a Speaker. Now, I remember Adam and Sitch uh, were condemning and, and pointing at the Democrats, saying, hell, I can't believe they would not help save McCarthy. This was such a terrible move by them. And my, my point in response to that was that if you are a serious political party and your opposition is fucking themselves, and that is what's happening in front of the entire country, putting aside Trump's poll, poll numbers or any of the national presidential poll numbers, we're talking about Republicans in Congress who are going to need to keep the majority they barely captured in the first place with the worst performance for an opposing political party during the first, mid first midterm in like, what, 30, 40 years. They need to build upon that. That's their goal, is to build upon that victory, expand that majority. Now, if they can't find some solution to get government running again, the idea that they're going to take over the whole country and then you give them more power so they can not fix anything on a broader scale, you know, the logic doesn't really make much sense. So they have to get stuff back on track. And if they can't get stuff back on track, why should Democrats stop their enemy when they're making a mistake? And if they do want to find an alternative path to the speakership, say through the Democrats, I think that they have to offer them some concessions. If you want Democrats to vote for you, you need to do something to get that vote. Just like if we were in, vice versa, we were in the same situation but reverse. Let's say AOC, Rashida, Rashida Tlaib, or any of these other people said, nope, we're not gonna compromise on Medicare for all, we're not gonna compromise on this. There would be a conversation about what would need to be done to get some Republican votes in order to get around them. That conversation might happen. There's a real possibility that could happen. Now, right now, in the Democratic Party in the House, unity is higher than ever. It's kind of hard to imagine that scenario exactly right now. But in that scenario, do you guys think the Republicans would just give some future Nancy Pelosi, just give Hakeem Jeffries the speakership to avoid this chaos? No, they wouldn't. They absolutely would not. And so 
I do think that Democrats should put forward what they would need in order to vote for any any House speaker. And I think top on that list should be stuff like bringing back the child tax credit. I think it would be great if we could tell Americans that the reason we reintroduced the policy that helped cut child poverty in half and put money directly into the pockets of working class families all across this country to help them pay for child care, to help them pay for health care, to help them pay for dental and vision and, and groceries and, and, and gasoline for their car. The reason they are able to reintroduce that is because Democrats came to the table and negotiated with Republicans and got something for their vote. It didn't just give them a vote so that the Republicans can go in there and try to make more cuts to Social Security, but got something out of it with the knowledge that they know that any time the Democrats could pull the rug out from under them. Now, what are the odds of this succeeding? Probably, probably not the highest in the world. In fact, I would say that McHenry becoming speaker is much more likely, but you don't know if you don't try, you know? You don't know if you don't try. If you don't try, then you're gonna fail by default. Some people say, if you don't try, then you don't fail. No, 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 no. In politics, you don't try, then you fail in achieving that goal by default. And so at least making those proposals known, even if it goes nowhere, you wanna know it'd be great if we could say, Look, we offered compromise to Republicans. We offered that if they were to come to the table and help working class Americans through a child tax credit, tax reform to help working class Americans, something that Republicans said they were in favor of. They're in favor of tax reform. They're in favor of policies that have help working class Americans. And they rejected it. But if you get us back the majority, we'll bring back the child tax credit. Bring us back this. We'll build upon these other policies that we want to bring in to help working class people. Even if it goes nowhere, Democrats can beat the drum on issues like this. Anyway, I know that there's some Democrats that are trying to do this. I know there's been some proposals, um, but I think the ask should be bigger, should be policy oriented. So even if it fails, people at least know what's the priority of the Democrats. And it's helping working class Americans. That's what it should be. But we'll see. Odds are the plan wouldn't succeed in the first place, but it's always good to be one step ahead in the narrative. Okay, so Jim Jordan just failed his third. He tried again. And we talked about this on yesterday's stream or during our yesterday's, uh, during yesterday's Jim Jordan Fat L session. But we were talking about how the Republicans opposing Jim Jordan said they were going to space out their no votes so every single time he would get more people voting against him. And they would also be naturally joined by people like, okay, guys, it's time to move on. We've already tried Jim Jordan once. We've already tried Jim Jordan twice. Let's vote against him. And so the first time he lost by 20 votes, the second time he lost by 22 votes, and now it looks like he's going to lose by another two to three votes. So every single time Jim Jordan runs, he loses by a larger margin. And then they had a secret meeting after the third failed vote where Jim Jordan beforehand was trying to convince them like, okay, guys, here's my new shtick. We're going to kick this can down the road. We're going to have Patrick McHenry. He's going to be a temporary House Speaker. And then later down the road, we're going to have an election again to see if I can become House Speaker. And the Republicans in this private meeting after three failed votes said, no, this is hogwash. We're not going to do this. We're not going to have a fourth round of voting. We already look chaotic. You know, obviously, these 20 people who originally voted against you aren't budging. Now more people are voting against you. We have to move on. And so in this private closed door meeting, the Republicans held a vote. And now Jim Jordan has been kicked out of the nomination process. He's been given the boot. So Jim Jordan, as far as we can tell, as of right now, has been eliminated from the speakership process. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Let's see what Republicans had to say as they were leaving this meeting. Because let me say, they had a lot of passion. They had a lot of energy. They, um, yeah, they're a little upset with how the Republican Civil War is going. We have big breaking news. We're going to the Hill now. A huge shakeup in the speaker's race. Let's bring in our chief congressional correspondent, Manu Raju. Uh, Manu, Jim Jordan now officially out of the race. Tell us what happened. 
Yeah, the, I'm here right now, right outside this very chaotic moment where Republicans just voted about whether or not Jim Jordan should continue on as the candidate for speaker. They voted against him. They voted essentially said that he should drop out of this race. And now there's going to be a candidate forum uh, next week on Monday for new speaker candidates who could yet emerge and then a potential speaker vote on Tuesday. I'm here with Congressman Dusty Johnson, who was in that room just now. Congressman Johnson, explain to us what happened in the room and is Jim Jordan. Um, hey, Dylan, why doesn't the candidate with the highest amount of votes just become the House leader? Because uh, they want somebody with a majority of votes, not a plurality of votes, to end up being a House speaker. Because then in the, if that was the case, then you could have it where somebody has like 180 votes, but out of a race of like six people, he gets the most. So therefore, he's the speaker, even if he doesn't have a majority's consensus and somebody else could have had a majority's consensus. I think that's why. There's probably other reasons historically which I don't, uh, that I haven't done the research on. And officially out as a candidate for speaker. I'm not going to talk to you about what happened in that room. I will reflect on what needs to happen next. I mean, clearly there is yet another void. We are going to have a couple more days of chaos as we try to get a sense of what's next. To me, it reminds me. I will, I will note, even the Republicans are calling it chaotic. Even they're calling it chaos. How incredibly irresponsible it was for 208 Democrats and eight Republicans to put this house into absolute chaos. I, I love I love how somehow they're trying to wrangle the Democrats to make it their fault. They elected a House speaker. They have a majority of votes. They elected the House speaker, Kevin McCarthy. It was their guys who started the process of unraveling, of unraveling, unravel, unraveling, ugh, unraveling. His speakership, calling the recall vote, and it was those eight Republicans that didn't vote for McCarthy that delivered him the L. Everyone already knew that the Democrats were going to vote for a Democrat candidate, the Republicans were going to vote for a Republican candidate. And the Republicans couldn't get their act together, couldn't get enough votes, and therefore sent it in the chaos. They couldn't get enough votes for McCarthy, they couldn't get enough votes for Steve Scalise, they couldn't get enough votes for Jordan. Jordan has failed on a higher level than every other candidate, losing more votes. Than every other candidate. Losing more votes than Steve Scalise and losing more votes than Kevin McCarthy. You can't pin this on the Democrats. If you want the Democrats to vote for your candidate, you need to go to the Democrats and be like, and Hakeem Jeffries has been open to this in the interviews that I've seen with him, and offer him something. And they've put out an offer. And one of the offers I saw, or at least one of the offers that was being floated, was that when it comes to, for example, the different committees, when it comes to who chooses what legislation comes to the floor, they want a 50-50 split with Democrats and Republicans. If you're going to have Democrats part of the coalition to make the majority, then they're also going to be part, wanting to be part of the decision-making process for what legislation gets voted on and what legislation doesn't get voted on. But maybe you don't like that. Maybe that's too much. Maybe you offer something else. I keep saying the child tax credit was such a big victory for Democrats. It would help people so much economically. It'd be good for Biden to show that what he's doing for working class people. We know that it cut child poverty in half while it was implemented, putting $500 into the pockets of working class people with families that they put in, that they take this money and they put it in the child care. They take this money and they put it in the groceries. They put it into living expenses. And we know that the vast majority of the money that people got, they put into living expenses. They put it back into the economy. But the Republicans voted against it once they had the majority and it was killed. And so if you want to concede to the Democrats in order to get them to join with you guys and have a candidate, go compromise with them on something like Ukraine. The Democrats all across the board, they're not messy on Ukraine. They support Ukraine. Every single Democrat has voted for the Ukraine aid. Maybe if you got your house in order more when it came to Ukraine, there could be a compromise there. Maybe with some child tax credit. There's a whole bunch of issues, but you got to give the Democrats something if you want them to step out of line and vote for a Republican. Just like you would expect major concessions if any Republican was to end up voting for Hakeem Jeffries. Without any kind of a plan for how we were going to move forward. Now, we really do need we really do need. I don't I don't know why the Democrats need to fix their mess that they made by doing the recall vote. Somebody to step forward, somebody who is mission driven, somebody who is focused on doing something rather than just being something. Uh, blind ambition has uh, distorted this process enough. We need to go find a leader. Mr. Donalds, are you going to run?
I, I like that blind ambition comment. That's what he's saying about the eight people. That the eight people, Lauren Boebert, uh, Matt Gates, these are people who are trying to tr- blaze a trail for themselves over the success of the party. That's what he. That's how I read that comment. To be made. Um, so right now, the, right now, the key. Hold on, everybody. Hold on, everybody. Our process is one where every member votes. They make those decisions for themselves. We are where we are. We are where we are. My view is we should be here in Washington, continuing to work until we resolve this. But what, um, what are the, you going to do? What are you going to do? Are you going to run for speaker? Mono, right now, I don't know what I'm going to do. Uh, what I'm going to do is, uh, frankly, sit down, think. Um, because we got to get our, our business together, and that's going to be my entire focus. Congress, Congressman Roy, how big of a mistake was it for the Republicans who voted to out, oust Kevin McCarthy about a plan here? Yeah, I'm like, I'm not going to go down that road. I, I, that's been asked and answered, right? I didn't support the motion to vacate. Uh, I supported Jim Jordan wholeheartedly. I think it was a mistake for the Republican conference to just walk away from arguably the most popular Republican in the Republican Party. So um, we uh, we shouldn't have done that. We just did. So now we got to go back. So who's going to be the By candidate the way, now? When he says the most uh, popular Republican in the Republican Party, you don't just rule the country. Number one, I don't know if that's the case. Okay, Jim Jordan hasn't passed a, a piece of major legislation in like 16 years since the time he's gotten elected. He's not. He's not no Mitch McConnell when knowing how to deal with like the legislative levers and our. It's it's part of the reason why these wacky plans he was putting out. Like, okay, how about instead of electing me now, we just have Patrick Henry be temporary, and then later we vote on me again when I got enough. But like, that's why he was throwing out so many wacky plans. So I, I don't I don't know if he's the most popular uh, person within the Republican Party. I don't think that's the case. But assuming that is the case, he's certainly not most the most popular uh, congressman with Americans. He's certainly not popular with independents, which Republicans are going to be trying to win going into the midterms. I honestly I think if they ended up having Jim Jordan as House Speaker, it would have been terrible for the country. It would have been terrible for trying to negotiate some deal with with the Democrats to keep the government open or negotiate any deal to keep the government open. It would have been terrible for aid to Ukraine, but it probably would have translated to a 20 to 30 to 40 House House seat laws for Republicans just from the chaos he would bring upon the House. That's my opinion. That's my opinion. I think already this type of behavior is going to hurt Republicans in the House. They have a very slim majority, very slim majority. And they're showing that with the little bit of majority that the Americans have given them, they haven't been able to get anything done. But when Democrats at the House and they had the Senate, they got the, they were pushing through the infrastructure bill. They were pu- pushing through the t- CHIPS bill to invest in infrastructure in the United States, to invest in, uh, in industry in the United States. We had the child tax credit, which cut child poverty in half for the time that we had it. We had COVID recovery, which went fr- relatively quite well. We produced more jobs than we had pre-COVID. People talk about the job recovery as all just COVID jobs. And a lot of the millions of jobs that have been created were COVID jobs. And not COVID jobs, as in jobs from COVID, but jobs that we lost during the shutdowns. We have picked up millions upon millions more jobs than that. There is stuff that he got done with that small majority. Now, I wish we got more done. I wish we got stuff done on healthcare. I wish we kept the child tax credit. I wish we got... Uh, in my opinion, more aid to Ukraine. I, there's there's like critiques I could give, but he got stuff done. They've been able to do nothing except start an inquiry into Hunter Biden's cock. Yeah, I'm, I'm being facetious, but you get my point. Uh, he, you think I'm going to start positing that? I'll tell you what, I'll pick somebody I definitely don't want to be speaker, and I'll mention that name. But why, uh, why is it so hard for the GOP to get their act together here? Look, I've, I've answered this before. Um, you can agree or you can disagree. Uh, we have our Democratic colleagues will not work with us on a single thing to secure the border. Not one thing. In any- you're, you're the ones who can't get behind a candidate. We just saw it today. Joe Biden is offering, I think, what was it? It was like 10 to 14 billion in investments in border security in the recent uh, over $100 uh, package deal that he's trying to negotiate with Republicans. It also includes aid to Israel, which I would assume that the Republicans would also be quite frantic about or quite happy about. I mean, I don't, obviously he's willing to compromise. He, he's literally said he'll b- help build sections of the border wall, which he, Joe Biden himself says, I don't think work. He said, I, this doesn't work, but we're going to do it anyway to compromise with you guys on this. 
So he's obviously willing to compromise their direction. In my opinion, sometimes too much. Here. No, no, hold on. So what we're doing is we're having a debate among the 221 who are willing to actually have a debate about the things our people care about. And some of that spills out in public. And you know what? It's a hell of a lot better than having a decision made by the Kremlin and foisted upon you. We are laying this all out. It's funny hearing it from him. He's not a big fan of Ukraine aid. In public view, and the American people can see it. It is the sausage getting made. It's the worst system except for, for all the others. You think now, this looks good? I mean, look. Having the American people be able to see how we are wrestling with the tough decisions and what we're trying to do and doing it with intensity and doing it because we care about this country. And God bless all of these people who put their names forward. All of the stuff that we're wrestling with because it's a hell of a lot better than the way the rest of the world has always done it. God bless. Okay, so he's trying to say that this is just democracy at work. But if you're going to send the house into chaos, you can like decide what you're going to do behind closed doors before you stop any of the legislative processes when the government was facing a shutdown. Like, I think that the, the inherent chaos of that is obvious to anyone. You can have democracy, and it's going to be somewhat chaotic, but they chose the worst possible moment to do this. Can do Congresswoman, right now, I am so East. sorry to interrupt yeah. you. Let's listen to Jim Jordan. We'll speak on the other side. Oh, mm -hmm. There's the big L. I appreciate it getting to work with everyone, talk with everyone. I got to know members in our conference that I didn't really know that well over the last three weeks. And that um, we, uh, we, we need to come together and figure out who our speaker is going to be. I'm going to work as hard as I can to help that individual so that we can go help the American people. And I'm also going to go back to work. We got, we got several depositions lined up next week in the Judiciary Committee, several work that we need to do uh, for the American people. We got so much work with us unable to pass any legislation. We're going to maybe we're going to rename a post office, maybe people in our investigative work so we'll go back to work there but it's important we do unite let's uh let's figure out who that individual is get behind him in the name of few streets after ronald reagan really really busy week it's work for the american people Jimmy, thank you all very much we can't do so apparently mitt romney is also was was basically giving uh jim jordan a tongue um, lashing you... from the senate this is from two days ago but this this guy I have a good feeling that he can give a, a genuine perspective into what a lot of establishment, uh, quote unquote, establishment Republicans uh, think about Jim Jordan, but don't say much publicly because they don't want the backlash. You recently announced that you will. Because, because there were like 20 of them that were dug in deep and then they were spacing out the no votes coming in afterwards. Why didn't Jim Jordan get their support? I'm curious about that. Let's hear from Mitt Romney. Not be running for re-election in 2024. And, and so I'm kind of curious if you could maybe take a few moments to reflect on your term in the Senate and what it has shown you about how democracy is being practiced here in Washington right now. Well, I, I think it's pretty clear that, that we're more divided as a nation than we've been in a long, long time. Uh, obviously, we were most divided during the Civil War. But we're highly divided now, and I think the, the reason for that is that our, our media has moved from a setting where, where there were editors and fact checkers, uh, and where if you're a crackpot with a crazy theory of some kind, you're probably not going to get it published in, in any kind of a way that's going to get picked up by the public at large. Uh, because, you know, 20 years ago, people read newspapers and magazines and, and looked at the evening news. Those things were all carefully vetted uh, in, in most respects uh, by editors, fact checkers and so forth. That's gone. You guys are getting your news, certainly as I do now, by uh, going on, on, on my device. Uh, that's curated for me. Uh, and I'm seeing stories, many cases I agree with, some I don't agree with. But uh, oftentimes what I'm seeing in social media, there are no fact checkers, there are no editors. And if I have a really crazy crackpot theory, just absolutely, completely wild out there, I can put it out there and get millions of hits. I can get a lot of people seeing it. Well, that was not possible. And, and the people who are influencers, if you will, and have the biggest following are people who are angry and are pointing out the, the foibles on the other side. And uh, interestingly, we're drawn to those things as human beings. And so politicians have begun to reflect that, hey, if you want to get support, you want to get money for your campaign, your next campaign, the more outrageous thing you say, the more likely it is that you're going to have people following you. And so you have people increasingly coming to Washington whose objective 
in staying in office is to make noise, not to make law, not to change things in uh -oh. a way that, that might be better for the country, but just to, to make a lot of noise and to show they're angry and fighting. I mean, right now, Jim Jordan, for instance, you've heard is running for Speaker of the House. Um, my former chief of staff sent me a message today and said, you know, it's interesting. Here's a guy who wants to be the Speaker of the House. Do you know how many bills he's passed that he's, that he's authored? None. And how many bills that he's, he's just been a sponsor on? By the way, you get to sign up to be a sponsor of a bill. All right. And so, you know, I'm on lots and lots of bills that I didn't write, but I'm a sponsor. None of the bills he sponsored has ever become law. So we're looking at electing a person who would be second in line to the presidency who's never passed a bill, but he's third in line to the presidency. But I second. OK, just probably slip of the tongue. Certainly well known because he's able to make a lot of noise. And uh, that's the currency of the realm these days in politics is finding a way to stand out and to be well known. And he's it, never passed a bill. Yes, he's never passed a bill. Yes. If, if I were to ask you the names of Congress people that you know, they'd almost all be people who don't actually do anything or pass any law, but they are very out. It is second in line, Dylan, you dork. It's presidency, vice presidency, then Speaker of the House. It's third in line. Second, technically, after the president. Whatever spoken and how does a democracy work one when the population is getting information that may or may not be accurate and two when the people that are most well known are those that aren't accomplishing things but instead are are performing and so politics so second in line i mean okay fine itself has become more of a performance art i mean president trump for instance i mean what is he good at uh, his background was performing he was on tv he was a wwf owner and and uh, would go out there with the wrestlers and so forth i mean that's what he did and that's what has given him the prominence that he's received so yeah it's a very different environment than might have existed in the earlier days of our democracy and it's kind of hard to understand where we're going to head where we're going to go in that kind of setting by the way the could you imagine the speaker of the house being somebody who's never passed legislation before? I wonder why those 20 Republicans didn't want him to be the leader of the Republican party in the house. I wonder why hard to figure out again, man, if he ended up being the house speaker, terrible for the country, even worse for the Republican party.